Uh, good morning. We are interviewing Forrest Fenn, who was born <clears throat> September 22, 1930, served in the United States Air Force, retiring as a major. I was born August the 22nd, August 1930. 22nd. I think you said September. I did. Yes. Sorry. Uh, August 22, 1930, served in the United States Air Force and retired as a major. Today is June <clears throat> 26th of 2013, and we are interviewing Forrest at his home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Gary Michaels and Roger Riggs are conducting this interview for the Albuquerque Oasis Veterans History Project. Forrest, we appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. My uh, pleasure, sir. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> why not starting start with a little bit of just biological information of where you were born, uh, uh, you know where where you went to school, when it, where you entered the Air Force, that type of thing. Well, I, w I was born in Temple, Texas. Uh, my, my father was a, a, a school teacher and then a, a school principal. He, he was my principal for. Uh, we started when I started the first grade. He started in the same school as a math teacher, 1936. Uh, then when I graduated from that school to go to a junior high. He graduated also, and he st we went to the same school again. So he was he was my boss for about uh, I guess the first nine years, and uh, uh, I was always in trouble. He uh, in those days uh, school teachers spanked the kids when they did something wrong. So I'd get a spanking at school, and then he'd spank me at, at home that night because I got a spanking at school. So double duty. Yeah, but any, anyway. Uh, We'd, we'd spend our summers in Yellowstone or around Yellowstone for three months. Uh, he was a fisherman and I was a fisherman, and uh, we both built motels up there uh, over a period of years, and uh, uh, it, it was a good life. Then in the, uh, I joined the Air Force as a private on September the 6th, 1950. Uh, I graduated from high school and I went to a Texas a I tell people I went to Texas A&M, and it's a true story, but I was there only four days because I, I, I couldn't pay the entrance fee. So in those days, I didn't register at Texas A&M. I just went down there and signed in. They gave me a uniform, and that's the way you did it in those days. Now it's a big, long procedure to get in those things. But but uh, they called me over the loudspeaker to report to finance, and I'd I just climbed over the fence and hitchhiked home, and that was the end, end of my education. <laughs> Your college education. But the Korean War came along about that time, and uh, I figured I was going to be drafted, and I, I knew I didn't want to go in the Army, so I joined the Air Force with three or four other buddies. And uh, I went to all kinds of schools, radar mechanic school and different things, and I didn't like it at all. And I worked for a couple of guys that I didn't like, and they didn't like me, so I went down to personnel. I was a buck sergeant, three stripes. And I went down to personnel, and I said, how can I get out of this place? And they gave me a bunch of forms to fill out, jump school, pilot training. I think I found I volunteered for about five different things. I said, I'll take the very first one. <laughs> And the Korean War was going on. They needed pilots. They they didn't like me because I didn't have a college education. And but they they, they gave me a pull motor test. Did you ever have? have they no. put you in a, a little air, a little thing that looks like a cockpit, has a stick in it, and you sit in like you're sitting in an airplane, and it's on springs. If you turn loose of it, it'll fall over. So your job is to hold it exactly level. To, to see if you have an aptitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this guy true. told me that I was the best that he ever saw doing that thing, because most of the guys just, I don't think it meant, they, they could weed some people out. They couldn't tell you whether you were going to be a good pilot or not, but they could tell you whether you were not going to be one. Mm -hmm. And so I went to pilot training, to Bainbridge, Georgia, flying the T-6. I was, the, I was in the last class that flew the T-6 in pilot training. Excellent. 53G. And uh, from there, I went to Laredo, checked out in a T-28, T-28A, I think it was, uh, uh, 900 horsepower engine. And I, I later purchased a T-28C with a tail hook, 
1,400 horsepower. I flew that thing around here for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, then, I, then I checked out in a T-33, and uh, I was a pretty good pilot. I was terrible in academics, but I was, and I, I was probably below, below average in demeanor or whatever they used to call that. Military uh, bearing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but I finished pretty high in, in flying, and so I got a, I, I got a fighter job out of pilot training. Everybody wanted fighters. So they sent me to F-86D school at uh, Tyndall Air Force Base. And uh, they had, were having all kinds of trouble with that airplane at that time. As a matter of fact, they were flying them out of Tampa, out of uh, McDill. And there was a saying down there, one a day in Tampa Bay. Remember that? Oh, yeah. One a day in Tampa Bay. It had an uh, electronic fuel control. And... Uh, I was, then they sent me to Scott Field to a 85th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, and the rule there was you had to get a third of your total time had to be at night, because it's instrument you fly instruments at night, and they wanted you to. But I, I enjoyed that. that uh, you, you learn to fly when you fly at night. That's when you. That's how you learn to fly instruments. <laughs> and uh, I remember one time we had a high, we had alert hangers that kept. I guess four airplanes in a row. Mm -hmm. And then they had a high speed taxiway to get onto the runway. So when they scrambled us, uh, we'd start the engine in, uh, in the alert hangar. And, and we had, to, the rule was you had to be in the air in five minutes, from sound asleep to in the air in five minutes, which mm -hmm. means you're sleeping with your G suit on and, and everything. And, and they, they were worried about somebody taking time to go down the steps, so they so they made these things like firemen have. You slide and down on a pole. Pole, on a pole. <laughs> and, and I remember this one time I was. They scrambled me about three o'clock in the morning or something. Uh, it was dark, and uh, I, I, I started the engine, pulled out of the the hangar, and lit the afterburner, <laughs> which was was routine. Everybody did that. But the tower called me and told me to pull it back because they had a VIP on final. You know, it was a practice scramble anyway, so who cares? So, so I pulled it back, and uh, the guy was about two or three minutes coming in there. And while, while he was landing, my engine flamed out. A malfunction of the, of the electronic fuel control saved my life, <laughs> that VIP. <laughs> Buy, buy that guy on final of beer. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But the F-86 D was, a, I, you know, I didn't know any better. I thought it was a fast airplane, but, but it but it really wasn't. It was not supersonic. And I had a buddy that got out of, got out. He was a friend of mine in the same squadron with me at, at Scott Field. But he got out and went into the uh, Air National Guard in Springfield, Illinois. So I was up in F-86D one time, and he was in an F-86F, and we were gonna we were gonna show off what we had, and I figured I'm gonna, I'm just gonna run this guy, he, he, he'll never see me again. So I lit, we we're sitting side by side at about 400 knots or whatever it was, so we said go, and I left the afterburner and just pulled away. But after about 30 seconds, I looked back and here this guy came and he just passed me going away in an F-86F and I was in an afterburner. <laughs> no, F-84F. F-84F, oh, yeah, F F swept wing 84. Yeah. Okay. okay, but I'm getting off the subject. Oh, that's all right. that's no, there is no subject. Yeah, just... So I became a general's aide after that and I, I, I flew the F-89, F-84G, uh, went to helicopter school. I, flew, I, I checked out in the F-86F. Uh, I flew the F-100. I think it was a, I think it was a C model, but yep. I'm not, but I'm not sure. No flaps. Uh, and I did that f for a few years. And the, the, the general I worked for got hurt in a in an accident, and so he retired. And and because I'd been a general at General's aide, I knew a bunch of people. Dean Davenport, you, you don't know that name, but he was a, a doodle raider. He was in personnel at, at headquarters, Air Training Command, and, and uh, 
I did him a few favors. At, at Randolph Field, uh, in the wintertime, those low clouds would come in off the gulf and stay for days. I'm talking about 200 feet. Cirrus. Uh, 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 not cirrus. What do they call no, those low scud. stratus? Just kind of like a scud. But anyway, they'd come in there at about 200 feet and stay for days. And, and Dean Davenport and these, these other colonels wanted their 150 bucks a month flight pay, so I'd get them in a helicopter and we'd fly, you know, we, we'd, we'd stay right there, Luke, on, on the air base because you couldn't, if the clouds were so low and you couldn't fly that thing in the, in, in the weather. As a matter of fact, it had balsa wing rotor, balsa wood rotor blades, and if it started raining, you had to land. <laughs> And hail it just absolutely wrecked that airplane. But, but anyway, uh, from there I went to uh, to the third to the thirty sixth wing at Bitburg. Checked out on the F one hundred at at Huilas, mm -hmm. Libya, and uh, that that was I, I, I learned to fly really at Bitburg because. We didn't. I didn't fly a VFR pattern for nine months, and the, our our minimums our minimums were uh, six hundred and three, but I had a lot of flying time. Not not in the F one hundred, but but they lowered my minimums to three hundred and one. And F one and F one hundred C without flaps, that's pretty low. And all all we had we had a. At that time, all we had was a, an ADF. We didn't even have VOR at that time. We got VOR later, but didn't have DME yet. And uh, fortunately, at Bitburg, there was a on the long runway. There was a railroad that that lined up with the runway. And about a half a mile from the runway, it turned left. So we'd let down and find that railroad. And get right on a railroad about 100, 100, 200 feet off the off the railroad. And when it turned left, you drop the gear and pull, drop the <laughs> speed brakes in the gear and pull the power back because you know the <laughs> runway's right. And it worked. It worked beautifully. <laughs> and we went to a uh, we had a gunnery school at Quilas Air Base in Tripoli, and and uh, uh, we had some really great guys down there. General Spicer, do you know that name? I know that name. He was a prisoner of war in World War II and a uh, very celebrated guy that uh, they were going to break it, they were going to execute him for something the Germans were. And the day before they were executing him, they, they were breaking him out of jail. I mean, it goes on and on. And his son lives in Santa Fe now, but he became a good friend of mine when I was a general's aide. He had one star. Uh, but I met Robin Olds, you know, you know that name, and and Chuck Yeager, and yeah. Hey, I just well, read that. I'm, book. I'm writing a book. I'm writing a story about him. He used to come see me at my gallery here in Santa Fe. Really a neat guy. He was married to a movie star by the name of Ella Raines, yep. mm -hmm. uh, a, a witch of a woman. <laughs> as as he found out, you know, they had a terrible divorce. But uh, you had to love Robin Olds and. And one one day we were, we were going to gunnery range, uh, uh, Jaeger and I and Robin Olds, and I was the first lieutenant. And uh, we sat down to brief, and Robin Olds says, "Finn, we want you to lead the flight." I said, "What?" <laughs> but we did that, and coming coming back, we were in S three of us. I was leading the flight, and then over the radio, I hear this voice: "Pretty calm flight." I didn't know who said it, but it was either Jaeger or Robin Olds. So I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I started to give him a lead. <laughs> but I, I added the power, and I pulled up, and I did a, a roll. And we didn't debrief it or anything. I, what does a pretty tame flight mean? The, did you were ever at Wheelis? No. Yeah. At, at the gunnery range in Wheelis in the, in the Sahara Desert, there, uh, there are packs of wild dogs. And if a pilot jumps out in a parachute, the dogs will kill him and eat him. So anytime we could find 
uh, a pack of wild dogs around the gunnery range. We forgot the tanks and the cars and everything. We're shooting the dogs. So we, <laughs> so, so we did that on that mission. And that and that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sporting, I'll bet. Yeah. And then from there, uh, I came back to Luke. I, I had connections from my general's aid days, and I could always write a letter. And when I, when when I left my general's aid job, I selected every assignment that I had from that point on, just from people that I knew, generals mostly, and, and colonels. And some of my buddies and personnel, you know, in the Pentagon and different places. So that, that was really good for me. And so I, I went to, from Bitburg, I went to Luke to, to teach the gunnery school. I did that for, for four years. And the uh, war in Vietnam was cooking off pretty good. That was uh, 19, must have been 19. Uh, 64, 65 in that time frame. Yeah. Yeah, I went to Reese in 1964 and stayed a few years, and then uh, the Vietnam thing was was really beginning to build up. And uh, uh, to get off the, the subject just for a minute, Jackie Kennedy came and stayed in my guest house here, my gallery, one time. She was working for for Doubleday as an editor. This was in. 1964, or 1984, and uh, uh, she had uh, she had taken a shower, put on a robe, washed her hair, wrapped her hair in a white towel, and walked in my office. I was working late. Mm -hmm. She had read a book that I and the flyleaf of a book that I had written talking about being in Vietnam and that sort of thing. And she wanted to talk to me about that. And she, she was almost in tears. She reminded me that her husband was the first president to send troops into Vietnam. And she said they called them advisors in those days. And she wanted to know all about that. And it was, uh, we, we, we sat there for a couple of hours. And, and, uh, but I thought it was really neat that, that she she could wander around with kings and queens and prime ministers, and then she could take her shoes off with cowboys and and, and do that too. Cool. I have a she left a brandy one, a bottle of brandy in my guest in, in by the sink in my guest house when she stayed. I think she stayed four or five days, and we spent a lot of time together. I really liked her, mm -hmm. so I I still have the half-empty bottle of brandy that she left. <laughs> But uh, what were we talking about? <laughs> oh, that, um, that was good. Uh, you were, let's see, you, you, you had gone back to, you were at Reese in about the 64 or 65 yeah, time frame. Yeah, and uh, my, my wife had asthma, and I didn't want to go to Vietnam. I didn't want to go any place and leave her for a year. So they, uh, they needed somebody to... to uh, a fighter pilot to fly into Reese and brief the brief the students that were graduating, you know what what it's like in the real world, and so I got an F-100, flew over there, and those guys had never seen an F-100, and it was a big deal for them, and and I'm talking about talking to three or four hundred instructors uh, uh, for about thirty minutes and question and answer, and I you know I kind of like that, you know the. Uh, I was into archaeology, and, and there's lots of archaeology around Reese Air Force Base, and so uh, the commander there asked me if I wanted to move over there and be, a, be an instructor, and I said, yeah, for, for two reasons. First of all, I'd, I'd been at Luke for about four years, and you don't stay very long, yeah, it's about time and so I, I, was, I was aimed at Vietnam, and I was pretty sure about that. So. We moved, and Reese was a good place for my wife to be with her asthma. 3,500 feet above sea level, and the weather was good and whatever. So I was there, I think, uh, got there in 64. In 68, I, f I figured it was time for me to go to Vietnam. So I volunteered, and I have a copy of the form. I, I volunteered for... 
I think the first thing I wanted was uh, F-100 because I had a lot of time in the F-100. Then 104, F-111 or whatever it was, and I still have that farm over there. And I have, I have a real good scrapbook that I got that I made in Vietnam. Uh, but I went over there when I was. I had orders to to the 306 squadron in the 31st Tac Fighter Wing at Tuiwa Air Base, Republic of South Vietnam. And about three days before I was to leave, I had to go to the Philippines through Snake School, yep. and then. I got orders to go to Saigon. They changed my orders. And I don't remember how I got, got those orders, whether somebody handed them to me or whatever. But anyway, I said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and uh, I went through Snake School, and I landed, uh, I landed at Saigon yep, in some kind of a big airplane. And... Uh, I had thrown my orders to, 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 to Saigon away, but I had my orders to Tuiwa. And so there's a, there's a 123 over there. The guy's getting into 123. I said, where are you guys going? They, they said, we're going to Tuiwa and then Phu Cat. I said, can I ride to Tuiwa? And I got in, in that 123 and went to Tuiwa. I checked in. I showed them my orders and got out. And then about two or three weeks, Somebody at Saigon called Abner <laughs> Ost, who was an ace in World War II. He uh, kind of a neat guy. Got in real trouble after he got out. Just got out of jail. Man. Yeah. But uh, there was a, a colonel that I had worked for at Luke by the name of Eugene Butler. And he was like the third or fourth in command at Tuiwa, and he was a really good personal friend of mine. And, and I went to him, and I said, Colonel, these guys want me to go to Saigon. I said, here's my orders to, to I'm checking out and everything. And he, he said, let me see what I can do. And he made a, four, a phone call and got me out of Saigon. So, but that was a stroke of luck. So I, so I started flying uh, the F-86, I mean the F-100C at, at Tuiwa, but we had, we had the 306, the the 308th and the 309th, and then the 188th Air yeah. National Guard out of Albuquerque, and the 166 or something out of Niagara Falls. Exactly. And those guys were terrible. They were worse than terrible. What? They were worse than terrible. And then uh, I was there about three months, and they, they promoted me into the command post. And you know what the command post does. I commanded the command post, and boy, was I a big shot. <laughs> because I told all the squadrons what to do, where to go, what to carry. And when I wanted to fly, all I had to do was call them, and I could get any flight I wanted. So I flew 328 combat missions over there in a year. About 50 of them were in for, flying as Florida controllers and OV-10s and whatever those little L-19s. I forget what they call that, the, the grasshoppers. Bird so dog, I got about 50 dog. missions in those things. And I think I flew three, uh, 207, about 274 missions in the F-100. And the, the, the D model. Uh, and I flew the C model. I was, a, I was an instructor pilot over there, so I flew some VIPs around. And one time we were, there was an Army, Army colonel, a commander or something, uh, wanted, wanted, to, wanted to see the combat zone from the air. And this guy was a big shot, and I got orders to, to stay out of the combat zone. You know, the, the, the enemy had uh, an aircraft that I think would go to 14,000 feet. So my boss said, stay above 14,000 feet. And, and so I'd, we're flying around, watching airplanes do different things, and all of a sudden the, the flak starts bursting above me. And that was the first time in the combat zone that they were that we found that the enemy was had a different kind of weapon that would go to like twenty thousand feet or something. I mean, my figures, I'm sure, are wrong, but that was so. I called Saigon and say 
this this stuff's bursting above me and he said well we'll get out of it we don't want to, we don't want to lose this colonel <laughs> and the colonel really got excited when he saw that in the aircraft boy he wanted no part of that I mean, <laughs> and i didn't either really but it, it, i didn't see it as a threat uh and one time when i was in the command post, I got some kind of a eyes only Twix out of 7th Air Force at Saigon. Two airplanes to go take off at my, this is not going to be accurate, but the truth is there in spirit. Take off about 2 o'clock in the morning, refuel somewhere, fly way up past the plane of jars, Dien Bin Phu, and bomb a house in China. I said, okay, and I, I was scheduled to go on, on leave to meet my wife in Hong Kong the next day. And uh, I, took the, I took the Twix into Abner Aust, the commander, and said, look at this, boss. And, and I think he flew it with, with some other guy. And, and later on, years later, uh, John Ehrlichman lived here in Santa Fe. He was a good friend of mine. And Halderman. You, you remember those two oh, names? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were both good friends of mine. And, uh, and John Connolly was a business partner of mine, and he was Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of the Navy, and different things. And all three of those guys, I told them this story, and I, I said, tell me what you know about us bombing China during the Vietnam War. And none of them knew anything about it. And, I mean, John... Alderman and John Ehrlichman had gone to prison and were out. You know, they had nothing to, yeah. no skin off their it. nose. Yeah. But not, it, was, it was a military <clears throat> decision to bomb China. I thought that was very interesting that Lyndon Johnson and McNamara and those guys knew nothing about this. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you had to be on, on target. I mean, it was dark, dark. You had to yeah. be on, on target plus or minus like three minutes mm -hmm. refueling once or twice going up and the same thing coming back. But when, when somebody listens to this thing a hundred years from now, I, I would like for to, to somebody to research that and see what was going on. Mm -hmm. I tried to find out and I couldn't. And I'm, I'm sure that, I don't know what was going on, but some, they wanted to kill some, somebody up there. <laughs> and then I was shot down, uh, I was on a, down uh, in the south, in the, in, in the Delta region of Vietnam, about, uh, must have been the middle of October or sometime, and I, I, I took battle damage, uh, 50 caliber battle damage, and it didn't hurt the airplane much, but it had holes in my wing, and the wings were wet. So I look out there, first time I knew that I was hit, I mean, the fuel was just pouring out of my damn airplane. My fuel gauge <laughs> looked like that. And there was a little old airstrip over there by the name of uh, Ben Tui. I mean, it was really a, a L-19 strip or something. I think, I don't, I'm sure I'm not accurate, but it was something like a 5,000-foot runway. And I didn't, I didn't think I was going to make it. Uh, and uh, I went through my bailout procedure, and I'm I'm heading heading down there, and I, I could see that it was going to be close. So I was all ready to jump out, and about two or three miles on final, I had about 220 or 250 knots or something. The engine quit, fuel starvation. So I dropped the tail hook. And I'm still ready to jump out. But I said, I think I'm going to make it. And I touched down just in time to grab that big anchor chain the wrong way, going the wrong way. And they, there were lots of guys watching because I declared an emergency. And, and <laughs> they said that, I, that I, I, I know that I touched down going about 220 knots in an F-100. It was a D model. 
No, wait a minute. I'm not. The second time I jumped out of a D model, but it may have been a C model. But anyway, I grabbed that anchor chain, and they and I stopped in like 200 feet, because I'm pulling the entire chain. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised.